Hey there, I'm Lisa Niven Kelly for Beeducation.com. And I'm Mel McKay with Beeducation.com. We just shot this great class over on Facebook Live, our Beeducation Live show, but we've edited it and archived it here for you to watch. If you hear us answering customer questions or talking to talking to customers, you can just ignore that. That was just stuff that was in the moment when we shot the class, but there's still so much great content here. Yeah, but if you have questions while you're watching this archive, go ahead and leave a comment below if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching through our site, just toss us an email at classes at beachcation.com. And we'll get back to you with an answer. Yeah, let's get into the video. been a lot of questions about pricing your jewelry mm -hmm. and sometimes people will put up a picture and say what should I price for this da, da, da. and it's kind of tricky it's sort of it's very dependent on your level your price all that so what we're gonna do today is go over a very general formula that we have found works for a lot of people mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about the exceptions mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. so let's just get started by talking about the general formula that we came up with or that lots of people use and I'm going to show you a little graphic here. Okay, so I just took one of our pieces of jewelry that we have as an example for some products and put it up here and sort of pretended like I was going to sell it and price it. And <laughs> They love our glasses. Thanks. Oh, thank you. I talk about yours. They're sassier. <laughs> um, okay, so looking at this, I've broken it down on the right, the cost of my materials, and added them up. And what we find people use mostly is he, right here, materials times two, and then add in an hourly rate. Yes. That's a good general formula. So for this, and remember, like on a lot of these materials that I used, I could have gotten bulk discounts. You know, I used a very expensive piece of leather. A lot of leather cuffs are a lot less expensive, but... The leather cuff was $7.56, the aluminum rectangle was $1.44, and aluminum rivets were $0.10, cents. and that comes to $9.10. Now, if you're paying yourself $25 an hour, which I don't know, some people may do that, you may do less, you may do more, depending on your level or your, or your experience, the materials times two comes out to $18.20, and if it took me, say, 45 minutes, three quarters of an hour, that comes out to eighteen seventy five. So adding those two up would be thirty six ninety five. That's right. I checked her math. It's she true. checked my math. <laughs> so I mean, that's I'll show. I'll bring this up again, but I just want to put it away for now. So that's a really general, um, like I said, formula that works for a lot of people. I spoke to customers. Mel and I have sold jewelry. Her sister, a bunch of my friends. I've spoken to artists, and I think if your materials are are basic cost, then that's a great formula. From there though, you might want to add in an overhead fee. You can do a flat fee or a percentage. And that would be if you, say you have a very expensive technique like stamping, you have to have a lot of tools. Um, maybe you want to add an overhead fee to help offset those tools or getting new tools or continued education. Or maybe you have a studio where you do have overhead of your power bill and rent and all of that. Um, Mel had mentioned also like the tags, the cost of shows, all of that. So some people do add in an overhead fee, whether it's a buck or 10 bucks or it's a percentage, you got to figure out what works best for you. Um, what I was thinking is I didn't used to do any overhead fee because I worked at home and I made seed bead work. So my cost of, of tools was like a dollar, like a needle and a pad, <laughs> you know, that's really different from, you know, jewelry work or metal work where you have a torch or stamps or whatever. What are your thoughts on that? Hammer, bench block, yeah. all of that. I agree. And the fact that if you are at a fair or show where you rented a little booth or a table, they may charge you a hundred dollars, who knows what. And if you want to kind of factor that in yeah. into all the pieces that you're bringing and you're right, like a $5 you know, per cost of each piece. It just depends. Plus, with tools, you're going to have to repurchase certain tools, too. Yeah, not our stamps, because there's... No, that's there. true. You're right. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe you have the space price. I'll bring this up again. Um, and that's what you charge, say, in your Etsy site. Um, and then you go do a craft show where there's pretty hefty booth fees, so maybe you tack on a couple dollars. You know, so that, I mean, there's some wiggle room there that you really have to come up with what works best for you. And as I mentioned in this, that this cost, if you intend to sell wholesale, this charge cost down here of $36.95 would be your, your wholesale price if a shop comes and wants to sell it in their store. 
they're going to double it. And a couple of my friends who, um, uh, to speak to that, who have been selling jewelry for a long time, their hourly rate has gone up. They've upped it because they can, they're getting well known, they have really distinct designs, and they're getting faster. You know, if you, if I made this cuff and I'm a beginner, it might take me an hour and a half, but if I'm pretty good at this and I can bust out rivets and bust out stamping, I could have done it in 20 minutes. That's a great point. Yeah, so you're right. So you, you can adjust from there. Another thing that I could talk about, because it reminded me of when Lisa mentioned that that would be the wholesale price, and that often if you're selling in a shop or a hair studio or wherever, you know, that you are fortunate enough to get your jewelry into, it's common to double the price. I think that a lot of people forget to make sure that if you're selling on your Etsy store or, you know, in another person's home or whatnot, make sure you match that price. If you're selling the, the same, pretty much the same designs, make sure you match it to the stores or the shop or whoever's going to be selling it so you're not undercutting them. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, if you have your business name on your tag and people happen to look it up and then they see you on your Etsy shop or your website. That's a good point. I've had this happen before where when I first started out, and I had sold jewelry for, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years before I even was working here, and people would say, why is your necklace, you know, $45 here? And then at the, at the shop, it's $90. Not only might you alienate those people who are shopping there, but they might be kind of bummed out and you don't want to um, shoot yourself in the foot with the store owners that are so, you know, nice to be able to carry your stuff. Yeah, yeah, and they'll, they'll probably sell it maybe faster than you will on it. Was, right, right, because they get more traffic. So I do think that if you have your stuff come back from the hair shop or wherever it is that you're able to have your stuff, you can then decide maybe this would be uh, like a discount stuff or like uh -huh. jewelry that you have you can put on sale and then do it for your other price. Or go ahead and think, the reason I'm going to do it for the same price as the store is I have to take the pictures. I have to write the descriptions. You're talking to the customers. You're, sh you're, you're going shipping and shipping it, it yeah. out and going to the post office. So really, you probably ought to get paid that money that the store is going to be paying to the you know it's men and true. women who are going to be selling your pieces. Right. And if a store is going to double it, a lot of people are like, why are they doubling it? I did all the work. You have to understand how much work they're doing in marketing and rent and all that. That's just the way it goes. Consignment might go a little different. Sometimes they take a smaller percentage but it just depends on the shop. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking through the comments here, and those of you guys that are watching, do look through the comments, because if we don't catch it, I'm seeing a lot of really, really good tips from people, and people saying, yes, I do that too, and and Sky says, oh, it, you know, prices can be so tricky, and she reminds us that, right, when you're buying bulk and all that, you get more into this, like we have bulk prices, all of your prices will come down if you're able to invest a little bit in materials and get that price discount. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we really want to talk about, and people are, are mentioning it in here, um, is that what you don't want to do is go on Etsy and just have a mission to undercut everybody. Mm -hmm. Because that is really selling yourself short if mm -hmm. you are not properly paying yourself. And it does a huge disservice to your entire niche and your entire market. And we talk about this a little bit. We have a blog post on how to price your jewelry for Etsy, and Angela's gonna put a link up in the comments. And it's really, really important, and I hear that from so many people, and it's been discussed in some Facebook groups, that if you're going in and charging 10 bucks for a bracelet that everyone's charging 40 you're going to look like there's something wrong with your product, and it's really unfair to the entire community. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Do you agree with that? Not only that, but then someone else is going to get on there and then undercut you, and then it kind of just becomes this war where it starts to get down so low that it's kind of denigrating even the design. I yeah, feel like because another strategy that we're going to mention is that sometimes you set this price, like whatever I had for that bracelet, then I go to Etsy or you know, a market or whatever, and I say, ooh, I'm close, but most people are charging 40 I'm going to up it a little bit. So a lot of people get their base price and then sort of look at what's out there in the world and adjust a little. So if everyone's doing that and adjusting low, no one's going to get paid anymore, and it just makes it look like, you know, stamp jewelry is easy and cheap, and we all know it's not. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Okay, um, let's talk. Did we get do all those talking points? Oh, I haven't talked about this, which isn't necessarily um, how, well, it is about how to price your jewelry. I, no one told me this when I first started selling, and the price tag, if you have, you're attaching your um, little tags for your necklaces or your earrings, and you're writing your information on there, to, I would uh, recommend using a sticker to put your price on there, if you have to price your own stuff, yeah. because as soon as someone purchases it, so often it's for a gift, and you want to be able to peel that off. 
or if you then end up discounting or the uh, shop is going to sell it for a different price, it's nice for them to be able to peel that off and put something on. So much better than having to scratch something out and, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, re- and remove the sticky and all that. Exactly. Yes, or have to use yes. another tag or give them another tag. So that's kind of helpful, I think, when you are pricing stuff yourself. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So I'm looking down at questions here. Um, we have a lot of comments. Like I said, go and look through there because people are talking about how they adjust it for their area. Someone's asking, would you adjust it for the area? And I, I guess, yeah, if you're doing a craft show, you know, in Bakersfield or craft show in Hollywood, you might, you might crank it up for Hollywood, but you just have to look and see, you know, but, but again, I start with like what I feel is right, you know, what, what's best here and then adjust for the market, adjust for Etsy, whatever that is. But the most important thing I think is don't price yourself so low. Like if you get to a place and you're like, my gosh, there are people here selling things for $2. I'm just going to end up discounting everything. You're just going to resent what the sales that you made. I feel like there's another market for what you've made. And maybe if you notice that that's happening and people are selling stuff very inexpensively, just make sure the way you package it is different, that you're doing something slightly different with your design. You're adding, you know, that extra touch or your customer service is such that they'll want to come back to you and pay a little bit more for because you're actually pricing it for what it deserves to be priced at. Yeah. And sometimes underpricing just doesn't work. I mean, I know for me, I don't like to spend a lot of money, but I do look at the price and go like, Ugh, why is this so cheap? If there's reviews, I check out the reviews. I think the other day I was buying like a ping pong table cover, right? And the $30 ones I just skipped and went to like a, you know, I looked at the ones that are more expensive because I need something that's going to hold up outside. You know, I'm not interested in just getting a deal. And the same goes for jewelry. If there's people undercutting you and maybe it's made overseas and it's not made very well or something like that, yours is just going to look more valuable. Um, I'm not saying crank it up, but you know what I mean. Well, on that note, this reminds me also, I was talking to my sister who wrote the second book with Lisa. It's not just, she makes jewelry as well. And we both had commented on the fact that If you are thinking of putting some of your pieces that maybe haven't sold for a while on discount or on sale, we haven't really sold a lot of our stuff on sale very often. And I don't know if it's because people do think, oh, this must be last year's design or why is this on sale? So, so often it might be kind of strange, but think of maybe taking the chain off, adding something else to the pendant, reworking it. I'll even go so far as to cut stuff up and re put it into making it into something different. And it's amazing how that fresh thing that I've made will be the first thing that will sell because I, I feel always. like customers can always smell like, oh, this looks so new and maybe it's something you're more excited about. So don't think that you have to discount what you've made. And I mean, it probably is a great design, but people just, it didn't work. Change it into something that might inspire you more and you'll probably sell it and you'll sell it for the price that it's worth. That is a good point. And some people are asking, like, do you do you write down your prices? I think it's a really good idea. Photograph and write the price down so you have something to refer back to. It'll really help so you to maybe don't have to do the formula every time. You can look at similar products from your line, right? Um, it will be so much easier the next time that you go to price things if you have it written down, like if you can put it in a Google Doc or an Excel sheet, or even I started out with just having it on a legal pad because then you can refer right back to that and realize, okay, maybe you're just changing a few elements, but it probably is similar. Yeah, 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 good one. And people are talking about packaging. Um, Sky made a comment that you want to make sure to include that in your price too. If you have some outrageous, awesome packaging, I mean, if your packaging is 10 bucks, that's silly. It shouldn't be really much at all, but that effort should be put into the cost of your, of your piece. Right. And as the labor, like, I mean, I remember I used to do, I started out, I did like hand stamping on, you know, my, my little cards or, um, whatever you're, if you're cutting out or hole punching or whatever you're doing, I mean, that's your time as well. Oh, that was interesting. Time of year. What might not sell at one time will later. That's a really great point, especially if you make holiday jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. You, you may not be able to, um, want to spend the money afterwards in investing in more chains and jump rings and whatnot. Maybe you do take that apart, but if you happen to have made a lot of money, you could save that for the next holiday since a lot of stuff is seasonal. Yeah. Perfect. And then did we talk about, uh, selling stuff in your Etsy shop that as like a discounted item? I, I don't did. know if I was looking through. Oh yeah, oh, that. I did say that you can, if you want to have it, if it isn't something that you're selling somewhere else, yeah, then you yeah. could just say that you're having, this is on sale. Yeah. Or, or use it as like your, 
I buy skirts from a gal, and she, her Etsy, she has a website, but her Etsy shop is just like seconds and things oh, like that, yeah. or lassies and stuff that's no longer on the site. And she links to her Etsy shop um, from the site. It's interesting, but it's a nice place to house all that. Oh, this is a good point. Donna says she puts a sticker on the storage cube where she keeps her stuff. Oh, yeah. That reminds me, um, I think it's maybe the same thing you're saying, but when you, when you buy your materials, you've got to remember how much you paid for them. So if you do buy in bulk and you buy 100 sterling half-inch circles and you're able to get that price, make sure you write it down. Like I run into that when I was doing bead work. I'm like, I have no idea how much I paid for these Labradorite beads. You know what I mean? So try to keep track of that because you got to work it into your formula. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, Jim's asking, where do you sell the majority of your stuff? I let people chime in. Tell them in the comments where you sell your stuff. I would say Etsy. Now Amazon has a handmade marketplace craft shows, local stores, your hairdresser, your own site when you get to that level. Um, that's what I would say. Would you add to any of that? Yeah, as soon as there's little pop-ups that they might have in your neighborhood too where it wouldn't be an expensive cost to yeah, have. Like a school fundraiser or something yeah. like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. This is a good question. Gail asks, do you have a program that you use to track inventory and pricing? I don't, but... I know they exist. Mm -hmm. um, I used to just use a spreadsheet. That's what um, I would do Or too. a Sharpie pen <laughs> on the bag. I have pegboard and all of my beads are up there and I keep it in a bag and mark it on there. But I mean, I know there's stuff that exists and as you grow and when you turn this into a real business, you have to track that. You have to know how much you own in inventory. And this is the trouble I had when I first started and got an accountant. She's like, I need to know what you own in inventory. I'm like, I have 600 like colors of seed beads I don't know and all this and then as I grew to this level of this business you do need to know that because you don't get to write it off just because you own it you write it off once you sell it and so once when you're growing and growing please start to build so that you're not at this point you have to backtrack and you're like I don't know what I paid for those findings and blah 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 so do try to keep track. Find one of those programs. And even if it's a matter for years and years, I would just keep all my receipts in a shoebox. And then I would, right before I went to the accountant or when I was doing taxes, yeah. just add it all up. And then I also had my sheets of what I had sold. So when yeah. um, I went to the shops or those receipts also, I just kept that in there and... You know. And then you know you need to break that out of the formula, so your cost of goods, right? Like, I sold this, my cost of goods was whatever I had on there, and then that comes out of my inventory. Mm -hmm. Oh, now we're getting all out of control. Okay, so... Google Sheets is good, Google I agree. Google Sheets is the best. What's great about Google Sheets, other than Excel, is you can access it from anywhere. So I can go on her computer and look at my Google Sheets, I can go on my phone. I do love that. Go, that's something at a store, mm -hmm. so it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm.